Hello, my name is Anna odrową Szkoc. I'm an associate professor at the Maria Grzegorzewska University in Warsaw and a chairholder for the UNESCO Janusz Korczak Chair in Social Pedagogy. It's a great honor for me to be here with you. Uh, today we'll be talking about social inclusion and uh, I will try to draw a picture from Poland. So first of all, let's define what is social inclusion. A social participation between vulnerable people and people within the wider society that is frequent and meaningful, such as frequent and meaningful social interaction and relationships would be between children with intellectual uh, developmental disabilities and their peers without these disabilities. Opposite to social inclusion, there is social exclusion, which has many uh, severe effects on society, on family and on individual. So it is to be avoided. For such an individual, social exclusion has negative effects on all aspects of life. Uh, from their perceived quality of life to their biological parameters such as, for example, high blood glucose due to negative behavioural patterns pertaining to health. In this context, it is worth noting that social inclusion exclusion are the most important determinants of health and well-being. Uh, for example, Wilkinson and Mammoth 1998 claim so. For close relatives, the experience that their loved ones are socially excluded can be a seriously stressful situation, whilst for society, social exclusion is associated with a significant uh, economic burden. Social inclusion is a proven method to reduce these burdens uh, and uh, to uh, have positive effects on health, well-being and quality of life of an individual, their family and the wider environment. Uh, so a few words about the Maria Grzegorzewska University. Uh, since 1922 we teach professions of trust. Our mission is focused on social inclusion and our values uh, APS stand for access, participation and social solidarity which is the theme of today's um, conversation. So let's start with the Polish policy uh, on social inclusion. Uh, I would say that after uh, the systemic transition from communism in 1989, um, Poland's approach regarding people with intellectual developmental disabilities has uh, been influenced by Western policies such as Human Rights Convention uh, and uh, CRC, Children's Rights Convention. And since 2004, the EU, uh, European Union policy concerning equal treatment. Uh, also, there is the Charter of Rights for Persons with Disabilities, 1997, which had the greatest impact on policy implementation and covered United Nations and European Union reports. And the Polish Constitution has also a, a big impact because it prohibits discrimination on any grounds and urges public authorities to ensure uh, special health care uh, to children and persons with disabilities, as the Article 68 uh, suggests, and provides assistance, subsistence, adaptation to work and social communication for persons with disabilities, as stated in Article 69 of the Constitution. Poland is a hub for the development of children's rights, reflected in Article 72 of the Constitution, guaranteeing the right to protection against violence, cruelty, exploitation and depravity, with priority for the views of the child. The Ombudsman for Children's Rights is the actual minister in government, providing special care and assistance to children with disabilities and their families. The Charter of Rights for Persons with Disabilities uh, signed, um, uh, ratified by our Parliament in 1997, emphasizes the right to an independent, autonomous and active life without any form of discrimination. It includes the right to a barrier-free environment, access to public buildings, transport, information and means of communication, the right to education, the right to work in the open labour market in adapted conditions and, for example, to participate in public, social and cultural life. Moving on, there is also the Act on the Education System, which provides children with disabilities with early childhood development support, education in all types of school according to their individual developmental and educational needs and predispositions, adaptation of the content, methods 
and the organization of the education to intellectual and physical capabilities of students, as well as the possibility to use psychological and pedagogical uh, aid and special forms of teaching. There's also realization of personalized learning process, forms and curricula, and also rehabilitation activities and prolongation of every stage of education for as long as it's needed, assessment of their knowledge and qualification in adapted forms and conditions, and free accommodation in special educational and pedagogical centers, free transport, and assistance to school or special center. Although there is no distinctive law for children and youth with intellectual developmental disabilities or mental health issues, it includes this specific group entitled to individual classes of five student classes with multi-specialist assessment involving students and parents or represent uh, students who encounter difficulties in functioning in a peer group, students who encounter difficulties in functioning in a peer group despite ability to attend standard schools, individualized education and in-class assistance, counseling, psychological and pedagogical support uh, are provided and parents choose the preferred form of education, either general, inclusive or special education. In practice, since 1989, institutional care has been on the decline and caregivers gained more choice. However, the ongoing changes include the feminization of care, lack of respite, a limited number of specialists available through National Health Service, insufficient focus on mental health, low income, inadequate financial support and disproportions in access to services between large cities and more remote locations. This resonated in the 40 days of protest inside the parliamentary building by caregivers and their adult children with disabilities in 2019. The aim of this educational support is really social inclusion. It is to uh, ensure independence of individuals at the end of the process, as much as independence as possible. Uh, it's all connected to access and uh, it is very important that uh, people are provided with freedom of choice that translates into this uh, uh, independence. Uh, this institu institutionalization is very important. Uh, participation in decision making and uh, in this regards for example what color the walls should be in the room of the person or uh, whether they're allowed to keep pets or not or whether they're allowed to burn candles at night and play music if they wish uh, these kind of aspects um, are all uh, really leading to the level of independence that we can see and uh, are very important for the real social inclusion uh, in, uh, in Polish uh, schools, uh, I would like to talk about some statistics now. You can see the latest statistics on the slide. Uh, the population of children and adults with complex intellectual uh, disabilities is increasing with more um, living into adulthood and on to older age. As a consequence, there is a need for education to ensure that their programs are reflective of policies and theories that promote social inclusion and practitioners need to develop their skills in collaborative joint working to ensure that needs are addressed in the future. So let's move on and talk about a professional of special pedagogue in Poland. Uh, it is actually a master degree qualification um, uh, which comes with ethical guidelines and a mission uh, to uh, to, to be one of the professions uh, of trust, of public trust. So the Ministry of Education uh, Act uh, 1578 of uh, 2017 regulated the profession of special pedagogue as dedicated to the care, upbringing and education of children with disabilities, socially maladjusted or at risk of social maladjustment. A social pedagogue is university trained through a five-year specialist master program in order to conduct educational activities in cooperation with other teachers and specialists. He or she sometimes leads, sometimes participates in lessons and activities run by other teachers and specialists in order to provide support and assistance during integration and group activities. 
A special educator helps with the choice of materials, forms and methods of teaching the children and young uh, with disabilities, maladjustment and at risk of maladjustment. Uh, they also conduct um, classes ad adjusted to specific individual developmental needs and um, psychophysical abilities including revalidation classes, rehabilitation and socio-therapeutic classes. In cooperation with the theme of psychologists and pedagogues, the special pedagogue prepares individual multidisciplinary assessment of the student's functioning level together with the individual educational and therapeutic program and its evaluation. Moreover, he or she uh, coordinates the implementation of the recommendations outlined in the special educational needs referral and cooperates with other specialists, uh, external clinicians, NGOs and special education institutions as well as the parents. General schools as well as integrational schools and specialist schools employ special pedagogues as children with individual developmental disabilities are entitled to study in all these types of facilities depending on the severity of their disability and this is most important to underline the decision made by their parents. In the general and integrational schools Special pedagogues' therapeutic influence is often supported by school counsellors who are either university-trained psychologists or social pedagogues. All these professionals are classed as highly trusted, uh, are highly trained and bound by the professional ethical codes of conduct. And uh, let's see what we have next. Uh, terminology, obviously, uh, this course is extremely important uh, for people to feel included and the way we formulate our ideas, the way we see the world, the, the language we use has an impact on how people with intellectual developmental disability are perceived uh, and integrated. Uh, therefore, I'd like to just show you one of the campaigns, um, not special needs campaign, that started in 2006 in the UK and was focused on uh, people with Down syndrome who uh, were campaigning not to be called uh, special needs. Although SEN is still widely popular in literature, pedagogical, psychological, medical literature, uh, it is coming out of use. Uh, so I'd like to go back to uh, the terminology I used today. I used intellectual and developmental disabilities, so IDD. And that refers to conditions that occur around the time of birth and affect an individual's physical, intellectual and developmental uh, capacity and is uh, a lifelong condition. A range of terms are used to describe people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. For example, in Norway, the terms development, uh, developmental disabilities and developmental disorders is used. Uh, the term used in the UK is learning disability. And of course, the SEN, special educational needs, uh, which is going out of use due to this campaign, not special needs that I recommend to you, for you to watch, uh, it's going towards individual or individualized needs uh, in a Polish language and, as far as I know, also in English. So, let's talk uh, about the barriers. Why is it so bad if the policy looks pretty, pretty good? So, first of all, there are local disparities in service uh, provision and feminization of care and lack of respite, which means that it's the carers who may be excluded, who may not be included because of the overload, because of too much work and not enough support. Uh, and they can be isolated and their children or uh, people in their care can feel isolated. So really for social inclusion, we need to provide mechanisms to support uh, women who look after, in the majority of cases in Poland, uh, look after uh, uh, children and uh, people with in uh, intellectual uh, disabilities um, and also other disabilities. So, uh, so here also the uh, the level of independence uh, of the persons in in their care, uh, the the issue of access is of paramount importance for the well-being of those brave women. Uh, also, mm, there are the barriers pertaining to uh, to challenging behaviour. In many cases of IDD, there may be some challenging behaviour, 
uh, that um, antagonize the environment around the person. So I'd like to talk a little bit uh, about the use of coercion. And um, I, I need to, to look into my notes. Uh, so, uh, health, social and educational professionals provide health, social and educational services because they have a politically agreed mandate to do so from the society. The purpose of the ethical guidelines developed by each profession is to give society confidence that the said professions are able to deliver what's expected from them. They are professions of high trust. Issues related to self-determination and quality of life are central to the ethical guidelines. Paradoxically, there is uh, uh, some way uh, to use force, to use coercion, which I would say is uh, against fostering social inclusion. Although social inclusion is a central aim in professional practice, it is inhabited, inhibited by problem behavior. The legal use of force and coercion as a measure to reduce the negative consequences of problem behavior creates a loophole to social inclusion. The use of legal force and coercion may carry a stigma which can hinder social inclusion. So is there an alternative to the use of legal coercion, especially when the use of coercion is prolonged? The term challenging behaviour is exclusively related to the population of people with intellectual disabilities. Other terms are used also uh, among practitioners to label such behaviour such as ab aberrant behaviour, dysfunctional behaviour, maladaptive behaviour and problem behaviour. However, the term challenging behaviour is the preferred term among experts within the field because it brings fewer negative connotations and is not associated with any devi deviating um, psychological factors. Uh, so how can we define challenging behavior? We can define challenging behavior as culturally abnormal behaviors of such intensity, frequency or duration that the physical safety of the person or others is likely to be placed in serious jeopardy or behavior which is likely to seriously limit the use of or result in the person being denied access to even ordinary facilities. And this is a quote from Emerson, 2001. Different studies confirm the prevalence of challenging behavior in people with IDD and describe it as high, but the reported prevalence between them varies. Some possible explanations for this diversity are variations in the operationalization of challenging behavior, characteristics of the samples and variation in measurement methodology. In a systematic review based on 20 prevalence studies of challenging behavior in children and young people with IDD, Simon Pinatella et al. 2019 found an overall prevalence rate ranging from 48% to 60% in children diagnosed with intellectual disabilities. In children diagnosed with autism spectrum disorders, ASD, uh, Simo Pinatella et al. found an overall prevalence rate of challenging behaviour at about 90%. The latter is not a surprise as stereotypical behaviour, which can include challenging behaviour, is a diagnostic criterion in ASD according to World Health Organization 2020. So challenging behaviour can be a barrier to social inclusion, uh, is by definition a risk factor for social inclusion. Typical examples of challenging behaviour displayed by people with IDD are aggressive behaviours towards others, physical and verbal abuse, uh, self-injurious behaviour such as face heating, beating on arms, and also higher frequency of stereotype behaviour such as hand flapping, uh, stereotyped vocalization, severe hygiene um, challenges and uh, pika, so eating inedible things. Such behavior may be a danger to the individual and to other people, may inhibit important uh, training and can hinder that person's opportunity for meaningful social interaction with others, which as we said at the beginning was a paramount a important factor for social inclusion. Despite declarations and treaties related to human rights, such as UN Declaration 2006 and national legislation and policies, many children and young adults with IDD 
continue to experience social exclusion. The use of coercion may be part of the issue. Social inclusion is built on the principle of overcoming existing differences and distinctions for over social benefit. In situations when a representative of one group um, holds power to use coercive force over another, this principle is undermined, drawing a clear demarcation line that uh, the service providers and the service users are different. And this was identified, for example, in Goffman's works, uh, Asylum, in 1971, when he was describing mental uh, hospital, mental institution, uh, and uh, the distinction between uh, staff uh, members and the patients. How can this distinction uh, aid inclusion? Regarding the issue of inclusion, Hem et al. 2014 and 2018 found that perceived coercion is related to a more negative patient-therapist relationship, building from a start a barrier, mental barrier to social inclusion. On the other hand, the safety of the person displaying challenging behavior uh, and the personnel concerned is equally important. Moreover, the use of coercion irrespectively of the country it occurs in, seems to be predominantly linked to the trust invested in the ethical codes pertaining to professionals considered to represent professions of high social trust. So what is it like in Poland? When can we use the force? Um, the Polish constitution prohibits discrimination on any grounds. Its article 72 guarantees the right to protection against violence and cruelty. Moreover, the Charter of Rights for Persons with Disabilities, 1997, that we discussed before, guarantees equal access to all spheres of life. These acts become problematic when confronted uh, with challenging behaviour or social maladjustment characteristics of some mental disorders and some disability spectrums. In the majority of cases, instances of challenging behaviour that may require coercive force translates to referral to a special school or speci special medical facility. Since the 1920s, the Maria Grzegorzewska, a Polish pioneer in special education, has advocated for specialist education for children and young people displaying challenging behavior. Maladjusted behavior may pose threat to the safety uh, uh, of self and the public. Enhancing the systematic and practical disproportionality in relations of power and helplessness that compromise the above-mentioned guarantees. According to paragraph 18 of the Healthcare Act 1994, supplemented by the regulation of the Minister of Health of December 21, 2018, on the use of direct coercion against a person with mental disorders, Force may be used against the will of the person with a minimum discomfort to that person. The use of direct coercion initially should not exceed four hours, but can be consecutively extended to six hours each time it is required for the safety and well-being of the person and their environment. It should cause the least trauma possible and can consist of holding, temporary, short-term immobilization of the person with the use of physical force. Compulsory use of drugs, immediate or prescribed as part of the treatment plan, uh, introduction of drugs into the body of the person without the person's consent. Immobilization, so overpowering a person with the use of belts, handles, sheets or straitjackets. Isolation, placing a person separately in a closed and appropriately adapted room. This doesn't sound like social inclusion to me. The above legislation pertains only to specialist facilities and to persons that commit an attack against their own or other person's life or health, or against the public safety, violently destroy or damage objects in their own environment, seriously prevent the functioning of a psychiatric institution or an organizational unit of social assistance. Although the legislation means to be a protective measure, it creates a moral dilemma for human rights and the rights of the patient. Moreover, the recent COVID-19 pandemic reinvigorated the legislation updating the Act of December 5, 2008 on preventing and combating infectious and infe uh, infections and infectious diseases in humans, 
with the introduction of the Article 36 from 2020, which allows the use of force against any person who does not undergo compulsory vaccination, sanitary and epidemiological tests. Um, sanitary procedures, uh, quarantine or isolation of compulsory hospitalization and who is suspected or diagnosed with a particularly dangerous and highly contagious disease, thereby posing a direct threat to the health or life of other people. In um, such instances, direct coercion may consist of holding, immobilizing or forcibly administering drugs. Therefore, the regulation of the Ministry of Health and the legislation on social inclusion remain in contradiction to each other in this respect. So, concluding, unfortunately, the grey area for inclusion related to the use of physical force remains controversial and unresolved revealing the limitations and the helplessness of the system when confronted with challenging behavior. Although there is a clear difference between IDD and mental illness, the response to challenging behavior appears to be the same when it comes to the use of coercion, including implicit and explicit forms, constraints, forceful handling and administration of drugs against the patient's will. Despite all advancements in European policy for the rights of people with disabilities, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, or CRPD, the response to challenging behavior remains insufficiently explored and addressed. So uh, I would like to close with three unresolved questions that remain unresolved and maybe you'll have ideas how to address them. Is it possible to foster social inclusion whilst maintaining the possible use of coercion in cases of intellectual developmental disabilities? How can a person with IDD trust professionals uh, that use coercion as a method of providing safety, protection and treatment? And what are the alternatives? I would like to thank you very much for your attention and invite you to contact me if you have any further questions or if you'd like to visit the Maria Grzegorzewska University in Warsaw. We would love to have you. Thank you so much.